right. Hey, guys, welcome to another episode of The Rise of Entrepreneur. And today, actually, we have somebody very special. And the reason why I say very special is because you've been asking us to bring an expert in a social media marketing. And this next person I'm going to introduce has 10 years of experience in social media marketing and top companies and entrepreneurs actually reach out to her to help them brand their own brand and take their business to the next level. Guys, I have here Teresa De Pasquale. Thank you so much for being here. Ooh, great job on my last name. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're excited. You know, many people have asked us to bring an ex expert to help us you know, talk about how to take somebody's brand to the next level. And obviously you specialize in that. Could you give mm -hmm. us some background into how did you get involved in this industry? <clears throat> yes, I will. I'm going to try to give you a cliff notes because it's long. I think I've lived many lives in my four years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually started, um, I started my entrepreneurial journey with brick and mortar. I own some health clubs here in Tampa. And um <clears throat> After I had children and stuff and I had some health issues, we ended up selling one and bankrupting one. I was kind of just hanging out, trying to figure out what to do with my life. Instagram was brand new at the time. It's when all of us were trying to figure out like, what the yep. heck is this thing? Is it like you put photos of your food or like, what are we doing? And uh, long story short, I decided that in this weird space that I had, I was going to try to do some fitness shows. And I was just kind of documenting my journey of doing these fitness shows on Instagram because I was just like, I didn't know what to do with it. Mm. And um, after... I'd say probably, you know, a couple, like six months to a year, I started getting a good amount of followers and they were like really interested in what I was doing and asking me questions. And so I ended up writing an ebook. It was called Bikini Mom Secrets. And I never, I'll never forget. I sold it on Instagram and I made like $5,000 in one day. And I was like, whoa, there's like wow. a business here. This is crazy. Yeah. And so at that point I was like, okay, I'm gonna start taking this seriously. Um, and so I ended up building some big marketing pages on Instagram. I had two different pages plus my personal brand page that I would actually sell like kind of advertisement on. Um, Khloe Kardashian followed one of them. It was like a big fitness page. It was this whole thing. And then I ended up kind of just developing a really big personal brand online um, through this organic social media marketing approach. So I basically ended up like writing a book. I developed an app. I built a huge, um, it was a high six figure online fitness business through just organic Instagram, social media marketing, just pretty much Instagram and like Facebook and um, really successful at that. And so as I started going, I was actually consulting for some other people on the side. So like my friend, Andy Priscilla, I worked for him for a couple of years and helped him build his brand on social media um, up to like 500,000. So before when he was like first starting oh, wow. his brand. Yeah. We're and talking so about kind of just, Andy Priscilla. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, I dabbled in it for a while until uh, I'd say about, I guess this is going to be 2024. So 2018, I joined a mastermind to learn actually paid media. Cause I was like, all right, let me put my big girl pants on and learn like actually paid media since I do only organic. Yeah. And it's funny because in this mastermind, everybody was asking me like, how did you do this? How did you build this brand organically? And so my mentor in the group was like, you're so good at that. Why are you doing this fitness stuff? You should just do this. And I was like, huh. And I was like, okay, I'm 35. Like I don't want to be posting pictures in a bikini forever. So I might as well. So I ended up selling my fitness business. I, I started my agency. Um, it'll be six years in January. And so that's how I got into this. And so I've just been doing it ever since. Amazing. Amazing. Well, first mm -hmm. of all, how creative is the name, right? The bikini mom secrets. <laughs> that's the, that's so, yeah. the name, right? Yeah, it was of my first ebook that I ever wrote. Yeah, yeah. and, and to me, ago. that's right away grabs the attention. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't care what the book says. What is the secret, <laughs> right? It, yeah. it, it drives you to want to know. And you said you made $5,000 from Instagram. So that picture interest, if that didn't happen, do you think you would still be doing that if you didn't make $5,000? I don't know. But I just, I mean, I'm I'm pretty quick with like, I learn things really quickly. And so like the second I saw there was money made, I was like, okay, I'm going to figure this platform out. And so I just started taking it really seriously and like yep. analyzing everything. And I think to be good at what I do, you have to be a unicorn because you have to be analytical and creative. You've got to be creative to understand how to get attention and the content, but you have to be analytical to figure out like trends and patterns and analytics, yeah. right? And insights and data and all that. So Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this question because I think it's important to understand that you had already businesses that were producing and, you know, they were existing, you know, gyms, right? Am I correct here? Uh, yeah. Yes. 
I you have left them, those. I, this time I left them. Mm -hmm. yeah, you left those to do this. Now, was the gym aspect, was that a passion or was that a business for you? Uh, both. Yeah. Oh. So I started the gyms because um, I used to be incredibly unhealthy. Yep. So, you know, I had ADHD, eczema, allergies, you name it. You know, every year I got sinus infections and I would bleed, you know, I was just so unhealthy and I had no idea it's because of how I was eating and living. And so I ended up taking a, uh, you know, when you go to college and they make you take the required classes that you have to take. Yep, yep. And I took a human biology class and I was like, whoa, I'm like, I didn't even realize that I was like poisoning myself. And so I made a lot of changes and changed my life dramatically. And so I was just so inspired by that, that I, I felt like I realized a lot of people, like, it's not that they don't want to be better. They don't know. I didn't know until I knew. So it's like, I wanted to be able to help educate and like, you know, improve people's health. So that's why I started the gyms, but obviously I want to make money. It was a business. Okay. Wow. So let's take a couple <clears throat> years back, right? You're obviously mm -hmm. very outgoing, charismatic. Have you always wanted to own a business or how did you come up about being an entrepreneur? Because we have a lot of listeners that are women that want to be an entrepreneurs, but they're afraid mm -hmm. to take that step forward and go mm -hmm. after their dreams. How did you figure that part out? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I have always been entrepreneurial, but like I'll give you an example. Even when I was, you know, 15, 16 years old working as a hostess in a restaurant, I was running that restaurant like it was my own restaurant. I was like running everything. And you know what I mean? That I've always just taken ownership in everything that I've done. That's just how I am. Um, looking back now, I was like, okay, I was entrepreneurial, but I just wasn't in those roles. And it wasn't until I had kids that I and this is just my personal thing. I'm not shaming anybody that doesn't want to do this, but I personally did not want to leave my infants with anybody, you know, I, and I wanted to work at the same time. So this was a solution to that. It was like, if I own my own business, nobody can tell me what to do. So I'm bringing my kids to work every day. So I literally had my kids there most days with me. And my son ended up going to Montessori school. When I had my daughter, I went back to work five days later with her wrapped around me. And I wore her in a wrap every day at the gym for her first day. Wow. <laughs> But that's why I did it because I was like, no one's going to tell me that I what I can or can't do. So I'm just going to make I'm going to start my own business. Where does this belief and philosophy came from? Did you grow up? I mean, I know we we chatted a little bit before this. You said you were adopted. Am I correct? Um, I was adopted by my stepdad. So he he's stepdad. raised me. He's I don't call him that because he's like my dad that's raised me since I was two. But my last name is not my like by lot by heritage. Yeah. Gotcha, so, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So how did you grow up? Did you grow up with both parents working? Did you grow up in a family hall, household where there was business owners? How did you grow up? Shockingly, no. It's so funny because I actually always think about this. My mom has been um, uh, in the restaurant industry. She's she's a boss babe, but she's like more of a C-suite executive. So she's been in mm -hmm. the corporate world. Um, and my dad was a cop growing up which is the opposite of entrepreneur because yeah. they're like the safety, stability, paycheck, pension, you know, like yeah, it's like yeah. the complete opposite. And so they thought when I first started my business that I was insane. They're like, this is such a risk. You're putting so much money in. And they were like, I think they meant well, but not really excited about it and kind of negative a little bit in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because they're not entrepreneurs and you know, it's, it is a big risk starting businesses. And so um, I did have to deal with a lot of that, but, I don't know. I think it's just something in me. I do think part of it also was I met my ex-husband when I was 21 and his family is entrepreneurs and they had a little bit of an influence on me as well. Ah, so okay. I think it's a combination of, I'm just one of those, you know, I like to know, I don't, I don't love being bossed around by other people. I need to be the boss. I love it. I love it. <laughs> And it was more just for my kids. You know, I wanted to do things on my terms. You know, I wanted yeah. to be creative and use my brain and work, but also be there with my kids. And so I was like, I'm going to just make, I'm going to make the best of both worlds with this. You know, we have one of the questions that just came up and it says, how do you compete in the business world with men in your industry? I don't even think about that. It doesn't even phase me. I never once think like I'm a woman, I have disadvantages or I just, it doesn't even phase my mind. Like I'm just as good if not better than men. I love it. So, I love it. I love it. it doesn't even cross my mind. Mm -hmm. So I want to, I want to get into the social media marketing aspect because this topic has been asked for a while now. If you mm -hmm. were taking over a social media page or branding with somebody who just started, what would you mm -hmm. say is the basic rule or principles that you go to, to be able to say, okay, I want to work with you, or this is how we're going to work with you. 
Um, okay, I think there's two questions in there because one is like, what would I look for to work with somebody? Is that no, like, kind of part of the what, question? What would your first basic, like if you were to come over and take over, you know, my business page or my yep. branding, what is mm -hmm. the first, you know, checklist you would look at, say, okay, this is yep. the things that we need to do with you? Oh, great. Yeah, I would do a brand audit first. That's what we do at the agency anytime. And so regardless of who the client is, we do our own brand audit. And basically, essentially what that is, is like looking at, you know, what are the core brand topics for this account moving forward? And like, what are the marketing topics that we're going to be talking about? Because I think people confuse that there's like your core brand topic. So like, I'm talking about personal brands right now, right? Yeah. yeah. Your core brand topic is what's going to position you as an expert, build trust and authority with your audience, right? And like kind of build that relationship with your audience. Your marketing content is what's going to overcome objections and get conversions. And so that's the first thing that we do is look at like those pillars, outline that, work with the client, say like, does this look good to you? Yes. And there's things that go on in that, that also um, depending on the platform that you're on is how we do the brand audit too, because each platform has different algorithms. And so we strategize the content differently depending on the platform. So we like, it depends on, you know, each platform would have its own kind of brand audit. It's, it's still you, the brand, but like how we would distribute the content would be differently. Would you advise for people to have multiple uh, channels of social media, like Snapchat, Instagram, you know, Twitter, all those things? Or would you say focus on one specific niche? It totally depends. Um, so I think that if, are we talking about just a beginner here? Like you said, if I'm just starting yeah. with someone, if they're brand new, um, everyone will tell you something different. I think I read that you had Grant Cardone on this podcast, right? Or something. So I know like people like Grant and even Alex Ramosi will be like, you know, go everywhere all the time, be omnipresent. You should be everywhere. And and I don't disagree with that. The problem I have with that is that when you're first starting out, oftentimes you don't have a 35 person content team. You don't have a big budget, right? And so I think that's really overwhelming for people. And what happens is they'll hire a VA overseas and put out really terrible content and ruin their channels before they even have a chance to have good content. So I don't typically recommend that if you're just starting and you don't have that kind of a big budget or team, I would say pick one platform, dominate it, learn it, master it. Once you get a foothold there, then you go to the next one and then you figure it out. And by that time, hopefully you're monetizing these and then you can hire more team and then you can start putting out content everywhere. So that's For a I brand recommend. new person who is a beginner, who does not understand social media marketing, could you explain the law of monetization? Like what is monetization? How does one work it? Why does that concept is needed? Yeah, I mean, not everybody wants to monetize their social media, but I think everyone likes to, right? Because if you're going to spend money and invest time and energy into this, you'd want to get something in return. So the idea of monetizing it, obviously, is either selling something directly or like what we do. One of the things that we're really good at is we don't do a lot of direct selling. We a lot of times actually will send traffic to an email list or, um, you know, guides or opt-ins. And we are really good at building email lists or sending traffic to like opt-in pages. Um, so our clients can monetize it that way in many ways, right? So if you have an email list, you could do email marketing, you can retarget them with ads, right? So you can do a lot of things that way. Or even just building an email list, even though you're not necessarily making money, that's monetizing your social media. Because if you were to go on Facebook and run ads to try to build your email list, I would say if you could even get a lead for, you know, opt-in for $2 it's, it's the cheapest you'll probably ever find on Facebook. So if you're looking at $2 a lead, you know, like some of our client accounts, we're getting like five. We have one that we're just getting like 13,000 opt-ins a month right now. Can you imagine how much that would cost? Yeah. 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 Wow. So if you look at it that way, even though you're not necessarily selling anything at the moment to do that, because like obviously in online marketing world, you want an email list. That's it, right? Data. You want a list. So that's one of our main goals. So it's that is considered monetizing because we are providing something that they can make money on in the future, right? It's a Got huge it. database of people that is their ideal people. They can make money on the future. So it could be that. It could be selling something like a product, program, physical product. If you have a physical product, you could do a store on Instagram or TikTok has the new TikTok like Amazon store. Have you seen that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's there's many ways to do it. But yeah, it's just getting something back from all the time and energy you spent Understood. into social media. Yes. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm paraphrasing here. You said you don't grow your Instagram organically. No, we do. We do. You do. We do mostly. Mm -hmm, we do mostly organic. Mm -hmm. Mostly. Okay. And how do you grab mm -hmm. that attention? Through content? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's all... Yeah. So for people that are newer, it sounds like you have a newer audience. Um, yeah. Basically, organic means you're not paying to get reach or get in front of people, right? So 
like I call Facebook a pay to play platform because if you want to have a business page on Facebook, if you don't pay for page likes, it's very hard to get in front of people because it's a pay to play algorithm, right? Whereas on Instagram and eventually on Facebook, I do want to put this note, there's, you know, on, on Facebook, after you get an audience, you can grow organically, but in the beginning you have to pay for it because there's, if you don't have anybody on the page, you can't yep. grow organically because there's nobody to give you engagement, right? Whereas like Instagram, the way it's set up, there's still a lot of organic reach because if you make really good content, people will share it, right? If you make really good content and people engage with it, you'll hit the explore page, you'll hit the hashtags, that's where people can find you at, right? And so like there's different ways to get in front of people without having to pay for it. And so that's what we do. We focus on taking the client's content and turning it into content that we know that people on Instagram like to consume and engage with. And that gets the action the engagement is basically a signal to the algorithm that it's great content and then that pushes it out to more people and so that's how we grow the pages now you're an expert in this field and if somebody said hey what would you say is an actual importance in growing your social media would you say it's sharing the content comments would you say it's you know being able to create new content because a mm -hmm. lot of people are confused which route should they focus on? Do I create yeah. a lot of engagement or do I focus on creating a lot of content? Because there's a lot of people out there that just go out there and dump a lot of content, but yet no one yep. cares about that content. Which one is that's it? A great, that's a great question. And the answer changes over time. So I can tell you where it has been and where it is now. Um, it changes. So one thing that does not change, and this is like basically you'll hear if you've ever heard me speak or read anything of mine or anywhere, I always say engagement is the currency of Instagram because let's talk about Instagram specifically with organic growth. Yeah, engagement is the currency of every social platform, but especially Instagram with organic growth. And so, what does that mean when everyone's like, "Well, what does that mean?" Engagement. It means you want people liking, commenting, sharing, saving, spending time on your post. So people don't realize that actually people spending time on your page is engagement for Instagram, right? Mm. Clicking your website link and sending you a DM. There's nine types of engagement. There's passive and active and interested engagement. Wow, you guys heard a nine so different types of engagements. Could you just repeat those one more time? Yep. Okay, so we have active engagement, what most people think of. Mm -hmm. Likes, comments, shares, and saves. That's what most people, when you say engagement, they think of. And then there's passive engagement, which is time on page, and reach and impressions. So reach and impressions is basically how many people saw your post, and then out of how many people saw it, did they come back and watch it again? That's impressions, okay? And then the last two is interested engagement, which is a website click, like a link click in your profile or a DM. And Understood. so all of those actions count as engagement on Instagram. And so like when we're devising a content calendar, we want all of those. So it's not necessarily one thing over the other. Throughout the years, there's been different metrics that we've noticed that like Instagram paid more attention to. So for a while it was comments, which is why everyone did the comment pods. Remember the comment pods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah, tell yeah. you right now that is not, it's not, it's not as important as other things. So right now I would say shares and saves are huge. Wow. Okay. There's shares and saves are the big ones. That's the ones we notice the most. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when somebody goes into Instagram and copies that link and sends a text message with that link, does that create engagement as well? Would that be part That's of a share? share? That's a mm -hmm. share, right? Okay. So yeah. they, they do register that as I copy the link. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. What if I copy a bunch of links, but then no one else presses on it when I share it? I think it's a register as a share because they can't, they don't track necessarily, I guess they track profile views. That would be considered a profile view. So if somebody clicked that link and came and visited you, that would be tracked as a profile view. Wow. And so that's another thing you can look at. Like it's understanding your data. So like if you look at your insights and you see a bunch of profile views, but you're not getting followers, then you need to look at like, is my branding need to be fixed? Because obviously if people are visiting your page and they're not resonating with it, there's a disconnect in your branding, yeah. right? Um, or the look of your content, maybe you need to redesign the look of it. A lot of times people have very messy, chaotic, crazy looking or like just not professional looking pages, like for yeah, their yeah, pictures yeah. and their photos. So it could be that. Um, it could be, yeah. I mean, it could be that the content or you know hashtags or whatever you're hitting to get in front of new people those people are not your ideal clients so when they come to your page they're like not really interested so everything on there gives you so much detail of like what's happening with your content there's so mm -hmm. much to talk about i could talk about this for hours yeah <laughs> well, what would you say is the purpose of going live how does that help somebody um it i mean it does help the account one thing that i've noticed is you know going live 
the accounts that use all the features on Instagram. And when I say that, I mean like stories, reels, lives, like, right. The obviously posting on the feed, the wall, um, consistently do get more reach. So I don't know if it's that like Instagram gives brownie points or if it's just, you know, that I think that when you go live, one of the benefits could be it alerts all of your followers that you're live. So it kind of just bumps you into their, their, you know, um, point of view again. So it's kind of like top of mind, right? They're seeing your profile, even if they don't click it, they see it. Sometimes this is going to be hilarious, but even if they click it on accident and come into it and view it, it's engagement. So you just like, have you ever been doing that where you like go to click a message, but it's a live and you hit it and you go in someone's live and you're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, why am I in this live? <laughs> right, right, right. But honestly, that's engagement. So, I mean, it, it does help you in those ways. It's kind of like if somebody engages with a Facebook ad for a second, that's engagement. Right. So it's the same idea. Um, but I don't think for a lot of people, like, I think it's going to do maybe one a month. Like for most of our clients, we don't have them doing a ton because it's not going to be the best use of most clients time. I don't know about you or like, I'm sure even your listeners, it's like, once you get to a certain point in your career and you know your time is worth whatever, $250 yeah. an hour, or some of my clients is like charged $3,000 an hour. So I, I don't think doing an hour live is going to make any sense for them because they're not going to be, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't correlate equate with what to they what they'd make, be yeah. doing something else. Exactly. Right, right. So now, it depends, but. That makes sense. Now, let me yeah. ask you this question. If you you know on social media, you're studying different accounts, you're looking at different people, who would you say right now really got their stuff together when it comes to social mm. media marketing? Uh, Alex Formose. Alex Formose, okay. Mm-hmm. He's killing it. And, and do you think, I mean, he's, the, a lot of people say he's the creator of the, you know, uh, the way the text is showing in the, in the screen, the way he positioned his content. Do you think that's what separates him? Or you think there's something no. else? No, I think that that was initially a trend. Um, actually, that's my friend, my Ryan um, McGinn. Do you know Ryan McGinn? He's the one that no. started that. He was their video editor. He did all that. Oh, he so, did that. Okay. Mm-hmm. He's the one that created all that. So um, I'm oh. super involved. Any marketing role, I know who did all the things. That's where most people realize <laughs> that. Alex made him famous for that because he got big. But I think Alex just has amazing content. He's a unicorn. He's like an Andy Priscilla. He's just extremely smart. He's got amazing content. And so he's just one of those people. That's where it's challenging because like even in his new book, $100 million leads, did you read yep. it? Yeah, yeah, yep. His social media, he says, I think that I, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe that the person he consulted with for his social media was Grant Cardone. And so Grant told him the whole posting ever all the time. And it's different because Alex already number one has proof that he's a month, you know, nine figure business, whatever, eight figure business owner. Yeah. So he's got major credibility. He's got incredible content. Not everybody has that, right? He's very charismatic. He's got a very unique look the way he like, he's got like a very no um, strips branding. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah. He's very interesting. So he's got these, like all these factors that make him really interesting. So yeah. it worked for him because he has those, but I don't know if that would work for everybody. I got like, you. What he tells them to do. Yeah. L- lately I've been reading and I don't know if you agree with this or disagree with this, but the people mm-hmm. saying Alex Hermosi's content strategies has changed. He used to put out two hour, hour and a half, hour long content where he would mm-hmm. just go very hard on one post or YouTube video. And now he creates these small content videos where he dumps a lot of information in such a short time. Do you? Mm-hmm. Wh- why do you think he changed his strategy? Because they pay attention to the metrics and they do what the audience wants. Wow. But if mm-hmm. if that if that's what audience wants, why has the comments changed to say, I used to love how you used to do these things, now what you're doing today? I'm sure no matter what you do, there's always going to be people who don't, you know what I mean, like that don't want it or want the old stuff. But the, you got to look at, you can't look at 50 comments and make a decision. They're looking at tons of data. They're looking yeah. at a month's worth, right? They're probably looking at 30, 60, 90 days of data, maybe six yeah. months. That's how we don't, we don't make decisions over this. We make decisions over, right? Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, he's the first person. There's other people too that are doing a good job, but he's doing a really good job. Um, I mean, honestly, I'm going to go out and toot my own horn, but I think my best friend that has been a client of ours for five years is killing it. And it's partly, it's us with our strategy, but she also does a really great job. She's incredible. Her name is Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Um, so this is pretty incredible if you want to listen to what we did. Yeah. We've been doing her page organic, zero paid ads wow. for the last five years. 
Um, she's about 500 and whatever, 100,000 followers. But we just did her book launch and she hit the New York Times bestseller. In one week, we sold 60,000 copies organically. And what yeah. would you say is the secret ingredient to that? Is it she time, five years? What is it? <laughs> she listens to me. Oh, she listens um, to <laughs> I love it's it. It's true, though, because other clients don't, and I have to argue, and she's so great. She's like, I hired an expert, and I'm going to listen. And and she has she's gorgeous. She's incredibly smart. So like, they, you have to acknowledge that that's part of the it factor, too, right? But the strategy-wise, she's never – like she listens to everything that I say strategy-wise, so her account is extremely healthy. So I want to give you a really big tip for Instagram right now that nobody really knows is that if you run Facebook ads to your Instagram, you lose most of your organic reach immediately. Oh, wow. I can tell every time a client does it because basically you are now telling Meta that your account's in a pay for play platform. And so one thing that we've never done with her, she's ne she's always said no. She's not let anybody do ads or whitelisting or anything on her page, which is why if you look, when we do brand deals for her, because we help her with her brand, I help her with her brand deals too. We actually don't whitelist because I tell them you're going to get more bang for your buck with the organic reach that we have because we have such big organic reach. Wow. So it's a good tip for you. Mm -hmm. But that's why do, she's her. How, how do you lend these type of clients? That, I mean, obviously, she's your best friend of five years. You know her very well. But how do you go and, you know, get someone like Andy Frisella? How do you reach those people in what you're doing right now? Um. Well, I mean, what I did in the beginning is different what I do now. Now I get referrals because now I'm well known for it. Right. But in the beginning, it's just, um, I actually was, uh, when I was in my fitness career, I was one of the sponsored athletes for first form. So I met them that way. So I oh, was okay. doing that. Mm -hmm. So I was working for first form and then became friends with Andy and Emily. And then Andy's like, I want you to help me grow my brand. So that's how I got it. And then that was kind of just, like I said, a side hustle thing that I was doing on the side. And then when I started my, um, agency, I started literally take, I took a couple of clients for free to prove myself. So oh, wow. I ate shit for the first year. I barely made any money the first year because you had to prove yourself. I need to get results, figure out my systems, my processes. And then when I started getting results that I charge money and then when I got better results, I charge more money. And so now I'm premium and I'm, I'm attracting premium people. So for mm -hmm. all of our listeners, the lesson here is that you have to prove yourself in the market to be mm -hmm. able to gain such a engagement and audience and clients. And you did that. You took clients for free. You, yep. like you said, you ate shit for a while to be able yep. to get the results. And now there's experts, companies come to you and say, please work with me. Right. Yeah. You choose yeah. your clients now. So what criteria do you look for when selecting the heart centered entrepreneurs and companies to do work with? Yeah, I love that question. Um, one of the big things for, like, for personal brands, it's really important, obviously, um, that the business makes enough revenue to make sense for us. Because as you know, there's different levels of support with social media, just like any other marketing, right? Um, yeah. So you could hire a VA, you could hire like a social media assistant who's kind of like the middle. And then an agency is going to be someone like me, who I'm like a brand strategist running in. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a lot more expensive. And so we want to make sure that it makes sense with that. You know, if the client's not doing at least seven figures in revenue, they're not, our, our, our fee isn't going to make sense in our marketing budget. Um, so that's a big one. Number one, number two is, do they have content for us to learn and use? Because we do charge a lot of money. And so for it to make sense for clients, we need to have content so that we don't have to bother them for stuff a lot. Right. So like wow. we want to have blogs or videos or podcasts or YouTubes that we can transcribe and dissect and edit and cut, right? Or else we're going to have to lean on them for a ton of content. So it doesn't necessarily make sense for them to hire us again. Gotcha. So that's the two big ones. Um, for me, you mentioned the word heart center and that's a big deal for me. I like working with people that are doing important stuff in the world. So whether it's doctors healing people or motivational speakers or um, entrepreneur coaches, they're helping new entrepreneurs. Like I like working with people that are like making a cool, like a big impact, you know? So um, I, I've been really fortunate. I work with amazing people doing that and i'd like to i like to keep it that way so i do i turn away probably 50 percent of people that apply at my agency right right and that's so interesting mm -hmm. because like i said in the beginning you took clients for free and now you're so selective in who you're working with so let's just say i want to work with you how do mm -hmm. i present myself to gain your trust to gain your you know time because like you said you know, you look at your time, you, you, you're you not going to spend something where somebody pays you $200, $300 an hour. You want to be able right. to give your energy to them. So what does the person on the other end have to show you to be able to say, please work with me? 
Yeah, we have we do an application process because as you know, like one of the things I think that's been really good for weeding out people that aren't a good fit. Like I I'm sure like you, like you're extremely busy. So I like to be really I have two kids also, so I'm very particular with my time. I only work from usually like 10 30 to 2 30 every day. That's my schedule. Nice. So I need to make sure these calls, everything is like gonna you know, make sense. And so I ask people to apply first to find out more about their business, which will tell me all the questions like. Do you have a blog? Do you have a podcast? Do you have an email list? What's your revenue? What's your goals with social media? Gotcha. Like, for example, if somebody tells me, like, you know, what's your goals? And they say, I want to grow a million people in six months. I'll be like, okay, no, <laughs> like, not happening. So they have to be a so, bit realistic, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. If they're not a business person, they don't understand how things work. I'm not going to take on someone that has unrealistic expectations. So it helps me also like when I'm setting up these calls and be like, I, I'll get on a call and be like, Hey, I just want to make sure we're really clear. This is organic social media marketing, you know? And one thing that people don't realize with organic marketing is it's really focusing on size mm. or it's focusing on sales. Okay. So do you want to monetize more or do you want to grow more? Because that directs our strategy also. And so we've got different packages for like brand growth or for like marketing. You can do a little bit of both. I've got strategies that we use to kind of mix like to where we can leverage it without direct selling and ruining the audience. But the more you sell, the slower you're going to grow because people get annoyed. Let me ask you this. So Why would somebody want to grow without selling? What's the because end goal of just need- growth? Yeah. Yeah. To grow a brand. Exactly. Because you don't have an audience to sell to if you can't grow. So in other words, like think about this, people forget that. What do you do when you're, you might be a little different because you're like me and we work on social media, but when most people pick up their phone to go on Instagram, what do you think they're doing? They're just, you know, screwing off. They want to like be entertained and like, they want to see some memes and they want to be entertained. They're not thinking I want to go on and be sold to every other post. They get annoyed. They're very annoyed. So the easiest way to grow slow is to constantly sell everything to your followers. And so we've got strategies that we use that do monetize and leverage the audience without direct selling. So Gabrielle that I just told you about, we've built a multi seven figure business with, I've only direct sold one time for one promotion on her page in five years. Wow. We took her, when I met her, she had a clinic in New York city. Her first goal was to become virtual. So we did that just through Instagram marketing got her out of her office and she got enough patients from Instagram to do that. Then we built, she has like a huge concierge practice, medical clinic. She's been doing like programs. So we'll do like a protein challenge and things like that. Now she does podcasts that obviously are increasing her reach, you know, now because she has an audience that people with podcasts want to interview people with big audiences, right. To leverage it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's all through organic Instagram. We've only done a one direct sell the entire time we built that whole business and just hit the New York times. So there's really amazing strategies you can use. That's amazing. That's amazing. One mm-hmm. question that keeps popping up right now, and then I keep seeing yeah. it. How do you deal with social media trolls? Do you respond? Do you ignore? Or do you entertain? It just depends. Um, if it's a troll, but it's like respectful, I will reply. If it's just someone disagreeing and like, you know, I'll reply. If it's somebody that's like attacking character or, you know, the way that you look, or something like that it's an immediate block and delete because you don't even entertain that obviously that's a total you know arrogant person that has problems with themselves um or if it's just like a silly comment sometimes we just ignore it so it just depends gotcha so it depends it's case mm-hmm. by case scenario yeah if somebody is mm-hmm. disrespectful somebody is trying to tarnish your character or your brand without knowing yeah. anything about you block and delete uh, yeah, I mean, if on our clients too, if it's somebody being mean or attacking our client or doing something, it's an immediate block and delete. If it's someone that disagrees, we leave it. And sometimes the client, it's a good opportunity for you as an expert too to go and reply and like have a dialogue or show your expertise, right? As long as it's a respectful conversation. Or sometimes it's just silly comments that we're like, okay, whatever. And and like on some of our clients' pages, we have so many comments you can't block, you can't you can't acknowledge all of them because there's just yeah. so many. They're on there. I'm going to share it something with you that I think is so, so interesting. You know, our uh, social media page for our business, Axelite, somebody, I mean, it must have been a hater or a troll. They went in and paid like bots to go in and comment mm. over 4,000 times saying the same thing. Stop calling my grandma or something like that. And yeah. somebody actually went out of their way to do that. Right. And it was impossible for us to block all 4,000 comments. I know. I know. So people are actually going to go out of their way to try to be funny or, you know, hateful. And a lot of times people are afraid to post because they care too much about what other people think. 
Oh, How yeah. do you overcome that? Well, I mean, now it's like riding a bike, right? Like it's so easy because it's just, I'm so used to it. But in the beginning, what I used to do and I do with my clients, because I, it's really funny. I have clients who will go and do TED talks and do huge auditorium speaking, but they're terrified to go do an Instagram live. Wow. <laughs> like, what? like it's just so the psychology is so funny, yeah. right? Um, and I'll tell them, I'm like, the one thing that I tell you is like, remember that what you're putting out is like for your audience and it's to help them and it's your obligation to help them. And so don't make it so much about you, put it, make it about them. So if you reframe it to where it's not all about you, it's about like you're giving and your service and your obligation, it makes it a lot easier to put out content because yeah. you're helping people versus it making about like everyone, you know, expecting you. And I, I mean, honestly, the only people that are going to talk negative about you are people that are not doing anything on your level. Only trolls beneath you are the ones that are going to be hating on you. I so agree. anybody that's doing anything important is not going to care or even be paying attention, honestly, probably. So I agree. What advice would you give mm -hmm. to aspiring entrepreneurs who are looking to build their brands online? Like what would be one piece of information we could quote right now, what you're going to say next, <clears throat> put it all over the world that everybody can utilize. What would that be? Start yesterday. Start yesterday. It's wow. only getting bigger. People think that they're so behind and it's like, it's, you, are you seeing like every, there's new, look at thread. I mean, there's so many things that are still happening. And so you're not behind yet, but you're going to be, if you keep waiting. And so just start, I, it's, it's very easy. I see people all the time that like start and then they just blow up. So I think people get analysis, analysis, paralysis, because they feel like they have, you know, like they're behind. It's like, no, just start, just start yesterday. I love it. I love so, it. I'm going to have rapid fire. We're going to ask going you five questions. Okay. Answer as quick okay. as you can. Okay. What's your favorite mm -hmm. holiday movie? Home Alone. Home Alone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's my favorite scene. Yes. <laughs> All right. Second thing. What's your favorite book that you would recommend to anybody to read starting an oh, entrepreneurship? That's hard. I personally think that entrepreneurship is the biggest personal development journey that you'll ever go on. And so I think there's a hybrid between personal development books and entrepreneurship. So I'd say one of the biggest books that impacted my life when I first started was The Four Agreements. Four Agreements. Love that book. Okay. Mm -hmm. First agreement is be impeccable of your word, I believe. So mm -hmm. that, that's Don't take anything book. personally. Yeah. Yeah. Great book. Great book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question for you. Okay. What's your favorite meal of the day? Mm. that's really hard i'd say breakfast because i love my egg whites i eat a yeah. lot of protein <laughs> that's the fitness in you <laughs> uh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> literally oh man okay let me ask you this what is the best and worst advice you have received ever ever like about anything or about entrepreneurship about anything oh gosh that is a tough question. Okay. So the best advice I've ever received is it's a quote actually, but just reminding me of it is like, if you want the rainbow, you have to put up with the rain. So I think people are very entitled and they think everything's going to come easily and it just doesn't work like that, especially in entrepreneurship. So be ready. If you want the rainbow, you got to put up with the rain. <laughs> wow. Um, the worst piece of advice I've ever gotten, I can't think of anything specifically, but I think it will go back to like when you first, when I first started my journey, everyone used to talk shit and thought I was crazy. And like, I think, you know, like, are you sure you want to do this? It's so expensive. And I was like, okay, but it's being an entrepreneur is the best thing I ever did. So I love it. I just I think listening to, to the naysayers would be the, the worst advice I ever got. Last question for you. If mm -hmm. you were to meet your 18-year-old self, what advice would you give yourself knowing everything that you know today? Ooh, I just got the chills. <laughs> oh. Um, believe in yourself because you are capable. I wow. think that in that like 18 to 30-year-old journey, you're just so figuring yourself out, and, like not knowing if you can do it. And like I now know I'm so capable of anything that I want my mind to. So I would have told myself like, you have everything you need to do it. Just got to believe. I love it. I love it. Teresa, I am so grateful for your time. You have no idea how you blessed us with your presence today, your information. Oh. You know, I know so many people probably going to be reaching out to you through social media, asking you to work with them, but they have to go <laughs> through that form, you know, and they have to make seven figure <laughs> revenue. So guys agency, yeah. know that.
right? And and again, I am grateful because I learn a lot from this podcast. Of and course. again, I am very grateful for your presence. Where can we find you? Where can our audience find you? Are you on Instagram? What's the main, you know, social media that you use if they wanted to engage with you? Yeah, I think Instagram is my favorite. So it's just my name. It's Teresa with an H, D Pasquale. Um, right. So you can find me there. Feel free to send me a DM and say hi. And uh, we can hang out. Awesome. Love your style. Love your personality. Thank, Thank you, you for everything you're doing. Have an amazing one. Take Thank care. Thank you. You too.